Amen. So good to see you, 1015. So glad to be together. Welcome to our ministry year. Exciting times for us as a church. Again, a new season, a new schedule as we're in right now, and therefore a new opportunity. And let me just say this too. I'm so blessed to hear of so many of you that are jumping in to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with the time that you have in this life that you've been entrusted with. Uh, every person that's truly born again by the Holy Spirit has been given at least one spiritual gift to be used, and often many have many spiritual gifts, and it's so exciting to see the body of Christ engage as the body and jump in, love Christ, and love the lost at this time in this place. I am so encouraged by that. And remember the bottom line for our fourth service that we begin today. Again, the bottom line for that is that more people would know the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about gospel expansion, and so we might have a small part in this as a church. We pray God would make it a significant part, and all of us coming together again to join in this mission is what it's about. And we're praying, and again, so thankful for those who are engaged and engaging as we speak of being used at this time. So that's encouraging. What also is encouraging is to announce to you, again, as you heard in many levels already, our new sermon series starting today in the book of Acts. And one of the reasons this is exciting is we're about to do, uh, Lord willing, I stress, Lord willing, over and over again, we're about to do something we've never done before. You say, what is that, Robbie? Well, we're going to take an entire year to go through one book of the Bible. Again, Lord willing. And I'm not kidding, as the preaching calendar stands today, what we start today, the plan, again, as far as much as we're in control, is to conclude in July of 2020, all right? So buckle up, we're going for a long ride, but we pray an incredible ride. There are 28 chapters in Acts, and we seek to go through each one in some detail and to see what God has for us again this year. Such a fitting message at a fitting time, and we're excited to do that. So as you can imagine, so much to say today and so little time, but let's briefly introduce ourselves to the book of Acts, okay? So one of my jobs right now is to introduce again with a message like this, and a book like this before we get into the meat of our passage today. So, what is Acts? The book of Acts is a continuation of the Gospel of Luke, okay? You should know that. Maybe you did not know that. We know that from Luke 1 and from Acts 1, where Paul or Luke indicates in his first book, and then again, that's affirmed in Acts chapter 1, where he reaffirms that, as I wrote to you in the first book, we'll see that in just a few moments. So therefore, Luke and Acts are written by Luke, who was a physician or a doctor, a close friend, again, of the apostles. Acts is also a very unique book. It is unique in its history of the church. The book of Acts provides the first three decades of the early church's history that is found nowhere else in Scripture in this way, and therefore nowhere else in the world. There are major themes that are common, kind of uh, rise up from Acts, where we get our tagline for our year. The first major theme of the book of Acts is power, power, without question. The person and the power of the Holy Spirit dominates Acts. Like there's this, there's no question about that. The Holy Spirit is mentioned 50 times, 50, 50 times throughout the book of Acts. He is the reason, again, the church sees what it sees. Then there's perseverance. Perseverance is a major theme through the book of Acts of strengthening and encouraging and allowing the church to persevere. One of the patterns, as we will document as we go, one of the patterns in Acts over and over again, repeated is the gospel is preached, lives are saved, the church adds to their number and immediately opposition comes against that growth. Then God intervenes and rescues and encourages his church to persevere and to not give up. And then the gospel is preached again and repeat cycle. That happens over and over. It's happening over and over again today as well. This is where we are as well within the church. And we will be encouraged to persevere in the midst, especially in the midst of opposition. And then thirdly, the theme of witness. So the reason the Holy Spirit is given, listen carefully, and the reason for perseverance is ultimately that we will be witnesses for Jesus Christ. I mean, that is the call, again, for us to go and make 
disciples. I mean, think about the Holy Spirit fills us now as a church and allows us to persevere. I mean, think about even this morning, every parking spot in the parking lot, busy day, huh? Busy day. Every parking spot in there is a form of being a witness for allowing people to know Christ. Uh, the pulpit, a witness for Christ. The ministry fair right now in the foyer, strengthening, encouraging disciples as a witness for Christ. The cross, the large cross in the front of our building as thousands drive by every day is a witness for Christ. Every church we've planted is a massive form of being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. To see new people saved and baptized and sent out from here and missions and missionaries and whatever, all of that is resulting in being witnesses for Christ, which the Holy Spirit again wants more and more for this to happen within our lives. So these three themes, power, perseverance, witness, they will present themselves over and over again. And listen, these are the themes where we want to grow. So let's just stop even for a moment and take stock of where we are, right? Like when you go to the gym and you set some goals and you're like, um, I'm, I'm this strong now. I want to be uh, this strong in a year from now. Um, I weigh this much now. I want to weigh this much a year from now. And you measure yourself. Have I grown? Have I gained strength? Have I improved from one year over the other? One of our kids was in athletics just uh, recently and a coach came up and the coach said, see where they are today, but wait till the end of the season and see how much they've improved over that time as they seek to grow in their skills and development. How much more, how much more should followers of Jesus Christ, where are you today? So again, stop and take stock right now. How are you doing with accessing, being filled by the power of the Holy Spirit? How are we doing in perseverance and endurance and not giving up and clinging to Christ? How are we doing in our witness for Jesus? Are we afraid? Are we not witnessing at all? Are we seeking to press into the Lord and shine our light before others? See, this takes stock of where you are September of this month and we go to a, about a year from now and God, may you by your spirit cause us to look back and say, I remember where I was, but I remember where I am today by God's grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit. My call to endure, the power of the Holy Spirit again filling my life and then to be a witness and a light for the Lord Jesus Christ, wow, has he taken this year. This is what we are seeking to do again as a church. So this is the opportunity in Acts. It's an amazing, it's an extensive book. Some of you are like, so how exactly are we going to go through this large and extensive book? We're gonna break this book up into six acts. Pretty clever, eh? So what we're gonna do is, I wanna show you right here, is we're gonna take the 28 chapters of Acts, and we're gonna break it into six separate series that constitute the whole, okay? And every series will have its own theme. Every series might have its own graphics. Every series is gonna have its own feel and application. And so I just wanna give you a bit of a preview. This is what we're gonna do, Lord willing, Lord willing, as we go through this. So today, we're gonna to start our first sub-series in Acts called The Church Begins. And we're looking at Acts chapters one and two. And Lord willing, this will take us six weeks to go through the first two chapters. And then you can see, I'm gonna go through them all now, but you can see where we're headed as we go through. And we hope that's helpful. So as we transition now to our first series, the next slide in our series graphics for this is, here we go, Act one, the church begins. Again, part of the greater series of Acts, again, um, as a whole. And as we do that too, a few Disclaimers, okay? So this is part of the introduction. Thank you for your patience. This is important. Trying to teach us a little bit, get us on the same page. A few disclaimers as we begin the book of Acts. So we will be going through the entire book, okay? But we won't be able to hit on every single word, okay, in all 28 chapters. So sometimes we will. We'll be going through again verse by verse and, and taking apart every word, but other times we have a whole chapter, and we might focus on a verse or two within that chapter and then build around it to provide the context and the emphasis, okay? But we don't have, if you want to go through every word in Acts, this series became one year, turned into about eight years, all right? So we're going to take one year. That's good. That's a good amount of time. Uh, secondly, this is a year-long effort. We'll have 
um, some small breaks along the way to allow us to take a big spiritual breath, jump into something like Christmas and Easter, whatever it might be, and then we'll jump back into Acts as well. It'll be a total teaching team effort as well as we do that here in the church. Also, as we enter into the book of Acts, some of you are like, man, I'm so excited about this chapter and this topic and this thing, whatever. And so as we go through Acts... We have to understand the theological approach and the hermeneutical approach. Hermeneutics, the study of interpretation. How are we going to do this? Two words that describe Acts fundamentally are, is Acts um, given to us as a description or is it a prescription? Is it, is it describing for us what happened, not to happen again? Or is it prescribing for the church the way that we should live and how we should be? What we're going to learn through Acts is the answer is both are true within this book. So there are times when events are described for us as the church that are not meant to be repeated, okay? Like Pentecost, okay? That happened once in that way, right? But there are other times in the book of Acts, it is a prescription for the church. This is how you're supposed to do it. So both will happen. Some people get so excited about certain elements of doctrine, they think it's 100% prescription and it should be exactly this way and it's a danger because it kind of goes on a tangent, I think, too far outside of scripture, but you can make the same error on the other side. No, it's only described for us, not to be us at all, and we'll just kind of do our thing different from them, okay? So it's both. Description and prescription, lots to come on that. We have a whole year to go through it. All right? That's gonna be good. Lastly, this. We will be Holy Spirit-led. Holy Spirit, help us to be Holy Spirit-led. What do I mean? Just like the book of Acts, we have a plan today, but whatever the Lord wants to do. If the Holy Spirit, just like in Acts 16, the Macedonian call, it says the Holy Spirit forbid the disciples to go to Asia and turn them um, elsewhere and just, and they, and they did with the Holy, we're gonna do that too. So we have a plan. We've got a year kind of planned out this way, but if the Holy Spirit wants us to change, we will change and we will trust him in the process. I wanna make sure you know that. We hold these things loosely in terms of we know whose church it is, Jesus Christ and his spirit to lead us in that way, okay? <sighs> okay, so without further ado, we're gonna jump into the book of Acts. If you haven't already, please open your Bibles to Acts chapter one and we will start by reading verses uh, one to five together, okay? So big year, here we go. Just as you're turning, just let me pray um, just for a moment. Uh, Father, I pray so much that by your spirit, you will teach us and lead us now. You will protect us and guide us this whole year and you will absolutely transform us. We are so needy, you must do it. Holy Spirit, we are desperate for you. And so help us to be as effective and as powerful witnesses as we've ever been for Jesus Christ in this very urgent and dark time. May the light of Jesus shine so bright even now, even now at this time in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Love you. All right. Acts 1.1. Notice this. In the first book, because that's a reference to the Gospel of Luke, right? In the first book, O Theophilus. Now, who's Theophilus? Theophilus, the name means lover of God. Some commentators believe it's an actual person, and it most likely is, maybe a Roman official, possibly a Christian who Luke know, knew kind of intimately. Other commentators say, well, Theophilus is a name means lover of God, representing kind of the Christian in the pursuit of Christ. But again, most likely it was a Roman official of some importance. He calls him excellent Theophilus in previous places. And so he's named only twice here, and we know nothing else about him, okay? So, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, that's the Gospel of Luke, until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Jesus, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during the 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And here's the promise. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait but to wait what? For the promise. What's the promise of the Father? Here it is. Which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay, so right from the start of this book, okay, the stage is being set for the number one game changer of all time, who is the Holy Spirit. Even as we go through Acts over and over and over again, this is what we realize, slide on the screen for you right now. This is what we realize, okay? It's the Acts of the Apostle. This is my Bible here. This is what I've done, okay? But really, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit, or it's these both, 
I mean, you can't have one without the other. So the apostles are documented, particularly Peter and Paul, okay? Really travel with them, but the Holy Spirit undergirds all of this. So as you go through that, understand the church cannot exist apart from the Holy Spirit. So the person, the presence, and the power of the Holy Spirit cannot be overstated. He is the difference maker. So we are Hope Bible Church, but we want to be Holy Spirit Bible Church as well, all right? And when you have Bible, Hope Bible Church and Holy Spirit Church again put together, then you have Hopeville. I, lo- I didn't come up with that, but I love it, man. Like, that's sticking. We want to be a vill of hope. Like, absolutely, so many people so desperate for truth and life and hope. They are so discouraged and so lost and so miserable and so angry and so discouraged and so depressed. Jesus Christ is the answer. You're here today. Jesus Christ is the answer. And listen, but we can't do this apart from the hope in Christ and the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit Bible Church, Hope Bible Church, again, allows us to be a beacon of light and a messenger of hope that is so needed in our day. And as it's been said, I think Bill Ellis said this. He said, the Holy Spirit can do more in five minutes than we can do in 50 years. That's so true, isn't it? When the Holy Spirit decides to move, man, people get changed like that. Parents, always remember that with your kids, all of us, in any situation. When the Holy Spirit moves, wow, it's more than we could do in half a century. So when the promise of verse five is fulfilled, Verse five, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The world would never be the same again. I encourage you, I challenge you. As we go through this series, find every place the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the book of Acts. Underline it in my Bible, it's a red pen or it's circled or it's put a box around. Every time the Holy Spirit is mentioned, circle or underline it and see just how integral, again, the third person, the Trinity is to our reality even here right now. So let's move on now to verse six. Here's the bulk of our text today. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, ready, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So Our sermon title this week is a bit of a spoiler. I know how much you anticipate sermon outlines. I mean, maybe you don't, but there's much for me as for anyone else. It helps us organize our thoughts, okay? But I like our sermon title this week, and it is really our outline, but here it is, okay? So it's, his power will be my purpose and then results in our plan, okay? His power will be my purpose, leads to my purpose, and will be our plan collectively. So number one, his power is promised the Holy Spirit. In verse six, the disciples are fixed on the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. I get that. They wanna know when. They think the military conquest of God, the Father of Jesus Christ, is about to be espoused. So they wanna know, hey, Jesus, When will all wrongs be made right? When will we see total rule and victory? And again, hey, to be honest, I can't blame them. Like, I would want to know that too. In fact, I mean, wouldn't you love to know that right now? Hey, hey, when? When are you going to really get this thing totally put together? Like, when are you going to come back and conquer everything? I get that. We, we, We cannot know. We will never know the timing of this. Only the Father knows, the Bible says, in many different places. Hey, by the way, when people predict the second coming of Jesus Christ, I mean, they're just, they haven't read the Bible, okay? They're dumb. Don't listen to them, okay? No one knows but the Father, okay? But again, you can't blame us, blame me, blame it for wanting to know. That's why so many of the great songs in the last 2,000 years have included a verse of eschatology, right? Stating the return of Christ and the victory of when we see him. In fact, today we will sing, after this message, sing a song that says, when this passing world is over, and we will see him face to face. 
I read this morning in 1 Corinthians 13, it says again, when the partial passes away and the perfect comes, we see in a mirror now dimly, but then we shall see face to face Jesus Christ and perfect will be upon us. Oh, yes, Lord. Our knowledge is so limited, but at that moment, we will see him in his glory. Again, the song says, when this passing world is over, we will see you face to face and we will worship you forever. Yes, Jesus, you are all to us. So, but notice how Jesus responds to the disciples' questions. He says to them, he says, listen, paraphrasing, I don't need you to get caught up in the timing. In fact, I'm about to put you on mission. Notice this too. The disciples, just before Jesus ascends, the disciples think this is kind of wrapping up, like everything's kind of wrapping up, like the story's over. And Jesus says, actually, I'm just getting started, right? The disciples think the conclusion's being written now. And Jesus is like, well, I'm gonna use you and we're just seeing the church begin. We're just about to see millions upon millions and millions of lives change, right? Again, so when you're a disciple and you begin to hear this plan that Jesus is about to tell them, um, you're gonna be world changers. Uh, you're gonna reach the ends of the earth, all right? So like, just put yourself in the shoes, the sandals of one of the disciples and you're kind of like, Huh? Right? Like, like, you know you're frail and limited, have nothing. I mean, and like, I mean, how dumbfounded would they have been? We're, we're going to do what? And you're going where? You know what I mean? Like, like this is what's happening. They're a bunch of ragtags. They are timid. They are scared. They are poor. They have no status. They don't have any education. They're unknown. They're made of fools again up until this point, yet soon to be absolutely unparalleled world changes. Like, well, how's this going to happen? Jesus is like, well, here's what's going to happen. Okay, you're going to change the world, but first I need to leave. And they're like, what? You know what I mean? Like, so like if Jesus is like the captain of the team, he's not just the captain of the team. He like owns the team. He supplies all strength for the team. He's the wisdom of the team. I mean, he un undergirds the entire team. He scores every goal, every point, every home run, every touchdown. I mean, he's done all of it, man. Well, the rest of them just say, go Jesus, go Jesus, right? And then he's like, and I'm leaving. And they're like, we're dead, right? I mean, that's, that's what's happening right here. Like, they just have no comprehension of how this is actually going to work. You leave and we change the world? What? But that's why the first word of verse eight is so important. This is one of the great buts of the Bible right here. Verse eight, look at verse eight. But, 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 ready? You will receive power. I'm leaving but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. Okay, we're gonna be spending a lot of time in the Holy Spirit this year, but I'm so excited about that. I love the Holy Spirit so much. Need him, need him, need him, need him. But let me just say this, okay? There's no greater need upon the church today than the person, the power, and the presence of the Holy Spirit. I want you to notice verse two in our text. Look at verse two, okay? Verse two is recounting Jesus in his glorified, resurrected state, okay? And notice this. Until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So what is this indicating to us? The insight here is Jesus in his glorified, perfect, resurrected body, yet was still reliant upon the Holy Spirit within his ministry, and you and I are not dependent upon the Holy Spirit? And you think you can have a family apart from the pens of the Holy Spirit or know the life for Christ or witness for him or serve and engage in ministry apart from the Holy Spirit? Are you kidding me? Jesus, in post-resurrection, still so reliant on the Holy Spirit of God. This, this is the example for us. Listen to this beautiful quote by J.C. Ryle, the wonderful Anglican minister, probably like 125 years ago or so. He says this, pray, pray daily for a great outpouring of the Spirit on the church and on the world. This is the grand need of the day. It is the thing that we need far more than money, machinery, and men. The company of preachers in Christendom is far greater than what it was in the days of Paul, listen carefully, but the actual spiritual work done in the earth in proportion to the means used is undoubtedly far less. We need more of the presence of the Holy Spirit more in the pulpit, more in the congregation, more in the pastoral visit, and more in the school. Where he is, there will be life and health and growth and fruitfulness. Where he is not, all will be dead, tame, formal, sleepy, and cold. 
Then let everyone who desires to see an increase of pure and undefiled religion, here's our response, pray daily for more of the presence of the Holy Spirit in every branch of the visible church of Jesus Christ. You say, my marriage is dead. Holy Spirit, fill that place, fill that. You say, my heart, my heart feels so cold. Holy Spirit is the difference. He's the difference. You say, I don't have any real passion for the things of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one who turns all of that around. You can try all your own effort, but the Holy Spirit is the one that causes churches to become alive and fill a song and worship and serving and mission and power and influence and perseverance and faith. The Holy Spirit is the one who's the absolute game changer. The entire mission and power and plan of the church ultimately rests on one person, the Holy Spirit of God. We cannot ignore him. And you know what? The only way this church has got this far is by this truth. The only way we've gotten this far is by the, the person, the power, the presence of the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I, was, I was thinking upon this this week and I was thinking about some realities of our history. And I remember in 2008, one very, very specific elder meeting was such a profound influence on my life. I journaled it in detail. I looked at the file um, this week to recall my memory and the detail that I wrote down, we were in a very, very important elder meeting to, do, to decide whether or not we, we purchased this property. It was in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. There are so many reasons why this shouldn't happen. I mean, I was just, it was such a battle for faith. You had faith and doubt, faith and doubt all around. And there's so many human reasons this would never, ever happen. It came to this very important elder meeting and the time was to decide we had to make a decision. Are we going for it or not? And the elder meeting, it started off kind of pretty good or whatever. They actually turned a little bit of negativity and doubt, which I get. Again, I don't blame him for that. It's just a matter of you feel the responsibility. You feel the weight of what's happening. And at, I specifically remember thinking to myself, okay, here we go. This isn't going to happen. So be it. And then all of a sudden, I'm telling you, I'm like, I'm like in a way that I've rarely experienced. In that moment, just as the tide began to turn kind of negative and doubt, and it's probably not going to happen. It's too hard. There's too much risk. All of a sudden, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit entered that room, your theology, or entered, entered hearts and lives in a way, oh, 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 oh my. And I remember all of a sudden, human uh, lips were stopped. And the presence of God filled that room so strongly and so powerfully. I was so overcome with the presence of God. I remember just falling to my knees and weeping at the weight of his glory and not fully understanding why. And everything turned in that moment. God would use that time as the elders began to be so stilled and understand God was speaking and asking him to. He gave the prophetic word from Joshua 1.8 that he is calling us to be strong and courageous. It's so amazing for me to think about that meeting and to remember what exactly happened with no exaggeration. Man was seeking to operate in a certain way and lacking faith and the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 no. Okay, okay. Your time right now is going to be set aside. I'm intervening because I have a plan for this church at this time to purchase this property by faith because I'm going to save so many more lives and build so many more churches and plant some more things. I have a plan. I'm going to, we had no idea, but at that moment, the Holy Spirit says again, I I'm stepping in because I'm the one who did this in the first place and I'm carrying it forward. And when I think about that and I recall that story, I am so encouraged by it because zero of me says, way to go, church. Everything in me says, the Lord's done it. The Holy Spirit has done it. And then here we are just last week, 16 years ago, Jill and I traveling down to Chicago for training. Pastor Ted Duncan preaching at Calvary Baptist Church. Greg McFarlane, John McDonald went to hear him because we wanted to probably have him in our core group as a youth potential guy. But something greater was happening hearing Ted at Calvary. Calvary became us. And 16 years later, here we are. Harvest Branton, Mississauga now is about to have their 10th anniversary. And they're about to plant a daughter church, our granddaughter daughter. Aww. All right, right? Granddaughter church. And 16 years ago, who would have thought in all the churches planted, it's all the Spirit of God. Lord, don't let us mess it up. Keep using us. Amen, church? Keep using us in this way. Amen. It's all the Holy Spirit. It's just the Holy Spirit. And when I, when I, when I, when I recall that and I affirm that, I'm saying, God, God, we have one life. Make it count. Make it count. What's your part in this? Big or small, significant for the Lord. Do not let your life pass by and miss God's power of using you, whatever that might look like, every single person. Do you think anyone can stop you when God's hand's upon you to be used as you seek humility and dependence? There's no way, there's no way. If you make it about you, you won't be used. You make it about him, 
and you guarantee you will be used. This is whom the Lord is looking for, men, women, and children filled with his presence, wanting to see his glory revealed. His power is promised, loved ones. Number two, my purpose is revealed. My purpose is revealed, what? To witness. So verse eight now in its entirety, but you will receive the holy power, uh, holy, you receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Notice, and, and you, and you, direct correlation, will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So don't miss this, okay? The power in verse eight is explicitly connected to the purpose. So I don't understand. What do you mean by that? The power given to the church must result in the witness from the church even to the ends of the earth. So when I get to heaven, new heavens, new earth, whatever all that looks like, it's gonna be awesome. I wanna go to Peter, man. There's a lot of things I wanna go to Peter. Hey, Peter, so like when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, were you offended? <laughs> did that hurt? I'm sure it did. You know? hey, but Peter, Peter, so like when Jesus is unfolding his plan to you in Acts 1.8, and he says, you're gonna be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I mean, tell me, oh, Peter, what were you feeling at that moment, right? Because Pentecost hadn't come yet. You know, he didn't have the giving the whole piece. So honestly, like, were you like, did you doubt it all? Were you kind of like, what? You know, like, what kind of things were going on? I, one of many questions I can't wait to ask guys like Peter. It's amazing here too. I love how Kent Hughes describes this context, like the shock of the disciples in what they're hearing. He says this, he says, Jerusalem, the Lord was crucified there. Judea, they had been rejected there. Samaria ministered to those half-breeds. The ends of the earth, Gentiles, Gentiles. What he says there, he says, the words that Jesus is describing as their mission was both spiritually and ethnically unheard of. It was preposterous for this to be said. And they're trying to take all this in in kind of one swallow and digestion of information. I want you to see this too, okay? And here's the, here, here's the secret, here's the point, here's the theology. As we pull this into our lives, notice in verse eight, okay? The power of the Holy Spirit must result in witness. Okay, did you get that? So when it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you. So notice it's not, and then you must be my witnesses. No, no, no. So what happens is it's not an imperative. It's not a command. You get that? What Jesus is saying is, you're gonna get my power, then you will witness. Like the one leads to the other. There's no like, you have power and don't witness. No, no, no. When you are empowered, you automatically have to witness because that's just what happens. So, so this, this is a huge, huge point of reality for us as a church. If we truly have received the power of the Holy Spirit, we cannot help or stop being witnesses for Jesus Christ. You will receive power and you will be my witnesses to the end of the earth. The one must come with the other. It's a statement of fact. You don't get one without the other. You wanna be a witness? You must have the power. If you have the power, you will then be a witness for Christ. This is what's happening. And we want you to know as we go through Acts this year, this is, this is so important too. We, we are praying for a wave, a wave of witness like never before. A wave of witness for Christ in this place like never before. A lot of things are adding up to this moment right now too. But if we're honest, like let's be honest, a lot of us are scared to witness in this crazy world we live in. Let's be honest too, a lot of us love our comfort too much to witness. Let's just be honest. We're just, we just love our comfort more than being uncomfortable in witnessing for Jesus Christ. I heard evangelism described recently as two nervous people having a conversation. Um, a lot of us, if we're honest, okay, this is, this is really important. And God forgive us if this is true. A lot of us just don't care enough to witness. Like we just, we, we just don't care about the lost people around us. We are like, well, I'm saved, so that's okay and good luck with everyone else. We gotta repent if that's, if that's our position. We, we have to be honest enough with the Holy Spirit and repent. 
as people and as a church. Some of us say, well, I don't know enough to witness. I was reminded recently that that excuse is most often gived or given with people who are more than 10 years in the faith. Isn't that interesting? I don't know enough to witness. What about the new convert? Why, why is the new convert, they know nothing, and yet they're often some of those powerful witnesses there are in the church. Like, they know so little, but what do they have? Well, they have a massive dose of reality in Jesus Christ. They have a massive passion, perspective, power, and then all of a sudden a purpose they've never known before. And they're just like, this Jesus who changed my life, I gotta tell you, he'll change yours too. The new convert knows so little, and yet they have such a burden and passion to share the gospel. So I think that excuse needs to be thrown out as well. All for training, all for equipping. We do that, and we're trying to do that more and more and more. But the reality is, again, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that he makes us witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. So personally, as your pastor, personally, I'm praying for a greater boldness and a greater love in my witness. Here's what I know, I don't, I don't have it in me in terms of I can't do it myself. That song, I'm not I, but Christ in me, has meant so much to me in recent weeks because it's Christ in me. He's the one who's done everything. He will be the one to do it. So Robbie, stop putting your faith or sight in yourself. Put your faith and your reality in the Lord Jesus Christ who does it, the Holy Spirit who's in you. I want all of us to be thinking right now, by God's grace and power, I will pray differently, I will live differently, I will speak differently, I will love differently. A prayer that God has given me in recent days and weeks is very simple, God, I want a greater love for you, I want a greater love for your church, I want a greater love for the lost. And I know that's God's will. And so I'm praying God will answer that in my life and give me supernatural ability to love people in a way that I would not normally do on my own because uh, what's at stake is, is too real and it's too great. Here's what Spurgeon said about the reality of our call to witness in evangelism. He says, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. If they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees. Let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. It's good. That's really good. May that be so many of us now. We look ahead a year from now and look back and say, wow, I used to be so timid and so scared and maybe just so unconcerned. But now all of a sudden I realize what's really at stake. I'll do all I can to make sure as few people as possible end up in hell apart from Jesus Christ. And if they, if they insist on it, they will walk over my body to get there. Lord, make us a church like that. And I'll say this too, in our church, we have some incredibly beautiful, humble, quiet witnesses for Jesus Christ. Evangel evangelists all over the place in their own way, not looking for attention, They're not trying to bring, I've been aware of this in recent weeks too, so thankful for that heart for Christ, a heart for the lost, going around, praying for, speaking to, loving, witnessing, serving in such beautiful ways. We want that to increase. I'm not trying to put anyone on a platform, whatever, just, just individually, those of us shining our light for the Lord Jesus Christ and loving day by day in very simple ways, leading up to great power. For all churches, prayer meeting coming up September 18th, all our church plants coming together, praying for these things, but the chance for us to join together and to see what he will do in our place. We have a thousand more seats now, starting today, technically. Let's fill them with salvation with salvation by his power and our witness. How awesome that is. So, his power, my purpose, and then we'll end here thirdly, our plan. Now, our plan collectively is in place. It's to go. Look at verses nine to 11. Don't mean to spend a ton of time on this right here, but verse nine, it says, and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. I mean, live in the text, okay? So you're sitting talking to Jesus, and all of a sudden he starts being lifted up into heaven. What's that like? Awesome. A cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, I, I understand that. I think I'd be gazing too, huh? As he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. By the way, that's an affirmation of Jesus' return. He went up in physical body, ascended in the clouds. He will return, physical body, descending from the heavens in the clouds and appear. Every eye will see. Every tongue will confess. Every knee will bow. Awesome, awesome, awesome. This is how Jesus will return. So these two angels appear, and there's a mild rebuke in these verses. There's a mild rebuke. But again, I got grace for the disciples, man. I'm looking up at Jesus. Like, this isn't exactly an everyday occurrence. This isn't a squirrel running across the street. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is Jesus ascending to heaven. And I'd be like, 
Ha, 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 ha. Uh, come back, you know, one of those things. But there he goes. I, I would just be like, wouldn't you? I'd be like, whoa. Isn't it amazing that the Lord wastes no time? Two angels show up instantly. He's anticipating. They're kind of like, you know, they're, they're stunned. They're still, they're silent. They're sitting there like jaw dropped. And two angels immediately appear. And they're like, men of Galilee. And they turn and they look. And they're like, listen, listen. He, he went up. He's going to return. But in the meantime, get after it. In the meantime, you got to get after it. There's too much to do. It's exciting to see what God will do in this way as well. So two things we learn from this text right here. It is right to long and be ready for the return of Christ. It is right to long. We're commanded in Scripture to do that. However, one of the best ways we are ready and longing for Christ's return is to get busy for the gospel, is to serve the Lord with the gospel That is our mission, to be witnesses for Christ. So, so good to long and be ready. One of the best ways we are ready for Christ is actively serving and loving him in the gospel of Jesus Christ to as many people as we can. And hence, that is the mission of our church. So, his purpose or his power leads to my purpose. The power of the Holy Spirit is my purpose to witness And then our plan collectively is to go. I hope we remember these phrases, his power and my purpose and our plan. So how fitting it is today. I'm so thankful for God's timing today. He's allowed us to be able to right now, um, not making anyone be uncomfortable, but we're gonna take a few moments to pray through this message, okay? So we do this from time to time. We love this. It's a wonderful way to start. Again, we have a prayer meeting coming up. All churches come to that, September 18th, don't miss it. If you wanna pray by yourself, do it, okay? I encourage you though, if you have the courage and you want to do that and love, pray with those around you. Maybe you'll meet someone for the first time today. Introduce yourself super quick, begin to pray. Pray what? Pray through the message. Power of the Holy Spirit, fill your church. May the purpose to witness be as strong as ever. And may our our plan again, the plan is in place that we must go. We can't just sit here. We must go, okay? So it's 11.19 right now. We'll probably get to 11.22 or so. 11.23, we're gonna pray together, groups two or three, pray by yourself, that's fine. But I encourage you right now, Louis is gonna come out, he's gonna play quietly underneath us and then we'll respond with our song um, of response, okay? Let's do that right now. Let's take a couple of minutes and um, and let's pray together.